week we discussed Paul's third rhetorical question from the beginning of Galatians chapter 3. He's asking a series of rhetorical questions. As a reminder, a rhetorical question is one that you ask in order to make a point. A question that you already know the answer to and the one that you don't really expect to hear an answer from because the person being questioned already knows the answer as well. Let us say that Henry, I hope we don't have any Henrys in here. I had to think about it, you know, I didn't want to pick out Bubba or Jim or Earl or somebody, so let's just say that Henry comes to church on a semi-regular basis. He knows Christ, or at least he knows of Him. And he knows that the Bible teaches us that we should come together for corporate worship. Romans, I mean, Hebrews 10.25 tells us that. But hopefully one of the reasons we all come to church is because we know that the Bible tells us so. And so we're being obedient to God's Word. Of course, the main reason we come to church is to worship and praise God and to hear the Word preached in order to be edified and lifted up. By coming to church, the unbeliever may be saved through hearing the Word with faith. By coming to church, the already saved believer learns more about God and His will for our lives. And this helps us to grow to spiritual maturity, assuming it is a true Bible teaching church and the believer pays attention. Unfortunately, pastors today witnessed some in their flock checking their watches, rolling their eyes, and losing interest. I suppose it's been that way even before there were watches. We'll read where Paul was preaching and he went on and on and on. And man fell out of the window dead. Paul was able to revive him. Don't do that here because I won't be able to do the same miracle. Personally, I've always felt and I feel today that that God is certainly worth a couple of hours of my time each week. He had time for us when He went to the cross. We've got 168 hours in each week. We come here for two hours. Surely we can hold our attention that long. Church attendance is obviously a good thing if done for the right reasons. But if it is done for appearances only, it doesn't do you much good. You must come with an open mind an open heart and be willing to learn. But still, coming to church is a good thing and it beats not coming to church. But now let's say Henry, who used to come somewhat regularly, begins to drift away and only shows up once a month or once every other month. David Jeremiah asked us the other day at the pastor's breakfast and then later on that evening also, did you ever notice how people always drift away from holiness and they never drift toward holiness? Well, my response to that from reading Paul's letters is that your spiritual transmission must be in gear. You've got to have it in D for drawing near to God and not in N for going nowhere. Since this is a cowboy church, I guess I should have said you got to have your spurs on. But when your transmission is in neutral, there is no power to the wheels, and all you can do is drift. Eventually, all your momentum will die off and forward progress will be stopped. And if you're going uphill, which the battle against sin is, you will begin to drift backwards. So in order to climb that hill, you must maintain power to the wheels through prayer, obedience, and hearing and reading God's Word. God supplies the power. All we've got to do is engage it. Put it in the right gear. Let's say Henry used to come at least twice a month. Now comes only once a month or every other month. Because I'm concerned for his well-being, I might ask him a question. Henry, do you think that attending church is a good idea? Now Henry and myself should both know 
But the answer to that question is yes. That's what makes it a rhetorical question. I'm trying to make a point to Henry by asking a question that he and I already know the answer to. And that's exactly what Paul was doing with these rhetorical questions he's asking at the beginning of Galatians. I'm also trying to make a point about church attendance by using the example as an example of a rhetorical question. But let's review the first three rhetorical questions from Galatians chapter 3. The first question to these foolish Galatians was, Who has bewitched you? Paul knew that it was the Judaizers who were teaching the addition of certain Jewish laws to the gospel of salvation by grace alone. Theirs was a gospel of Jesus plus works. This was a false gospel and they were false teachers. False teachers are still with us today preaching all kinds of false gospels. Either knowingly or by using wrong interpretation methods other than the historical, grammatical, literal sense of what the Bible writers meant when they wrote it. Some try to make the Bible fit their own personal belief system and others try to make it fit what they wanted to say and they twist it and turn it. For example, many teach that there are many different ways to heaven. All roads lead to the top. And that a merciful God would not let anyone go to hell. This is especially prevalent in today's all-inclusive, politically correct world. That is universalism and it is absolutely wrong. It is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible clearly teaches that there is a physical place called hell and there is a place called heaven and that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. He is the only way. All other religions, all religions created by man are wrong. Christianity is man reaching down to us, believing in Christ. All religions that are man-made are man's ideas and they're wrong. No one enters heaven except by the finished work of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Himself teaches about a literal hell which is prepared for Satan and all unbelievers. God does want all people to be saved. But it is not God that condemns man. It's man's own disbelief that condemns man. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. For His invisible attributes, namely His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made, so they are without excuse. That is Romans 1, 19 and 20. Man is without excuse. Man will be judged based on the knowledge he receives. Y'all have heard of the name of Jesus and the gospel message. You will be judged accordingly. Accept it and go to heaven. Reject it and go to hell. People in the Old Testament did not know the name of Yeshua or Jesus in English or Jesus in Greek or Christos in Latin. But they believed and had faith in the Creator God. They believed in the promise. They were held responsible for what was revealed to them. Noah did not know the name of Yeshua or Jesus. Job did not know Him by name. But they listened to God and believed Him. Abraham believed God and it was counted to him His righteousness. But having said all that, I want to make one thing perfectly clear so that you do not misunderstand what I am telling you. Everyone who is saved from Adam to the last saint in history is saved based on Jesus Christ, the Son of God. That is the only source of our salvation. Before the cross, God revealed Himself through His creation, or by direct communication. He walked and talked with Adam and Eve. He spoke to Abraham. He still reveals Himself through nature. 
And before the cross, there was the promise of salvation. The first gospel message was preached to Adam and Eve while they were still in the garden. And the anonymous author of Psalm 119, which is the longest psalm, the longest chapter in the Bible, longer than many books, but he wrote these verses. He wrote in verse 41, Let your steadfast love come to me, O Lord, your salvation according to your promise. And in verse 123, again in Psalm 119, My eyes long for your salvation and for the fulfillment of your righteous promise. Those lines were penned long before Jesus was born. But they clearly show that the author believed in the promise of a future salvation. Nowadays, after the cross, we have the written Word of God plus history. So whether before the cross or after, faith requires us to believe in things we have not seen and to accept or reject the knowledge that has been revealed to us. Those of us here today have the added benefit of 2,000 years of Christian history and biblical scholarship. It takes true spiritual blindness and willful disobedience to reject the overwhelming evidence of Jesus Christ. You have to have a hardened heart with all that is available to us today to reject Jesus Christ. Every man and woman who has ever lived has been born with a conscience whether they hear the name of Jesus or not. And if they do not follow their God-given moral conscience, then they will be judged accordingly. Every person has a knowledge of good and evil ever since Adam and Eve ate the fruit of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We inherited that. We know. If people reject the knowledge of God and of Christ that has been revealed to them, they will be judged according to that knowledge. And it will be more severe for those of us who heard the name of Jesus than for those who haven't. God does not condemn man. Man condemns himself through disbelief and rejection of Jesus Christ. Some people say that God is not fair because some people go to hell and some people don't. I'm personally very glad that God is not fair because I deserve to go to hell. We all do, actually. We all fall short of the glory of God. But God in His mercy has decided to save those who will believe in His Son, Jesus. You don't have to do anything else. All you have to do is accept what Jesus has already done. It is a free gift. Yes, Jesus, I know You died on that cross. I accept what You've done for me. That's it. Some people, like the Pharisees back in those days, are like the Rangers the other night. One out of way. Twice. And they didn't get there. The Pharisees had Jesus right there in front of them. They saw Him. He performed miracles. He raised the dead. They were that close. But they still rejected Him. Now, having been that close to Him, and they didn't believe it, no amount of preaching or reading is going to get them there. But it's that easy. Accept Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and you will be saved. Now other false teachers, especially most televangelists,